morning. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your faces, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father, who is in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And great singing, too, by the way, Carl. He, he, he reads scripture and he sings. It's, wasn't that wonderful for the choir? It's great. Thank you all. If, uh, if you have young ones, uh, ages 5 to 9, and you would like for them to, to head off to Children's Chapel this morning, now's the time for them to gather at the back door. And uh, if, you're, if you're new here um, and, you, and your kids are heading off, uh, they will come back to you. Uh, you don't have to go find them. They'll, they'll come back and join us for our, our closing song at the end of the service. Well, um, we're continuing in our, our series studying Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It, this, the sermon itself is, doesn't have a particularly Reformation Sunday feel, uh, but I will let you know that um, we're, a, we're a part of a, a network, a family of churches in our area, and there is a Reformation Day service that will take place this afternoon at 3 o'clock at Broadneck EP Church, which is in Arnold on Baydale Drive. So um, I encourage you to consider uh, joining in that service for worship. Our own Glenn Parkinson, uh, our pastor emeritus, will be preaching at that service. And so um, I think that's a wonderful opportunity to just be encouraged and, uh, and hear Pastor Glenn as well. So I'll let you know about that. But we are, are taking up this, this topic that Jesus touches on here in this, these, these short verses in, in the Sermon on the Mount about fasting. And we're going we're gonna to use this, this section of Scripture as sort of a, um, a springboard to, to look a little bit more broadly at the teaching of Scripture on fasting. Um, but I, I, I told you at the beginning of the service that for me, fasting has been something that, uh, that's been a little confusing. And maybe, maybe it's been a little confusing to you as well. When I was growing up, my understanding of fasting was, was basically shaped by a couple of observations that I made just, just being a kid. Um, first, the first one was that when I went to school, elementary school, I typically brought my own lunch. And so my, my lunch was typically either bologna and ketchup or peanut butter and jelly. That's, that's sort of the, that was the menu that, that I had to, to work with, or I guess that my, my mom was working with at the time. But there were friends of mine who would regularly buy lunch. You know, the, the cafeteria in my school would serve what, what at that time we called it hot lunch. And so you could, you could buy a lunch. I think when I, when I started uh, elementary school, it probably cost somewhere around 50 cents to have that lunch. And I think by the time I left elementary school, it might have you know, inflation might have taken it up to 75 cents or something like that. And so, um, so there were a lot of friends of mine that would have this lunch that the cafeteria would serve. And we, we sort of made the observation that the menu uh, for the, the lunch that they served in the cafeteria was sort of cyclical, um, but it was, it was also a little bit random in, in this sense. There, there was a, like a finite list of things that were that they would, they would serve over a period of time. But each week it would be a little different. For example, one week pizza might be on Tuesday, but the next week pizza would be on Thursday. So it wasn't like every Monday was the same and every Tuesday was the same. It was, they probably had more than five options and they would just kind of rotate them through. But here's what I noticed. Friday was always the same fish sticks. That's what it was. Every Friday, fish sticks. And, and you know, for, for the first few years, I didn't really make much note of that. I didn't, it didn't matter to me. I mean, you know, I'm eating my bologna, and my bologna had a first name and a second name, <laughs> and, you know, so I was good. And if, you're, and if you're a kid and you have no idea why people just laughed, 
Ask your parents what's so funny about Pastor Dan's baloney having a first name and a second name. And, and not only will they tell you, they might even sing you a song, <laughs> right? So, you know, I'm just, I'm just enjoying what I have. But, but for, for a number of years, the fact that Fish Sticks was every Friday didn't really, I mean, I noticed it, but I didn't really think a whole lot about it. But when I got into fourth or fifth grade, I started to, you know, I was, I was more in, inquisitive, you know, as I got a little older. And so there were, there were some of us that started asking questions about this. Why is it that for an, our entire elementary school career, it seems that Kenilworth Elementary School only served fish sticks on Friday? Well, here's, here's what we learned. Catholics. It was the Catholics. Our, the community that we lived in had a, had a significant number of, of Catholics who, who lived in the, in the area. And so it appears that the school accommodated their practice by serving fish sticks every Friday. And, and the reason that that's significant is because at that time, Catholics could not eat meat on Fridays. Now, that has changed since then. The, there, there, there was a change. Actually, I think the change happened in, officially in 1966, but, and I was in elementary school after 66, but, you know, like most changes, it takes time for, for people to, to catch on or for the changes to, to start to, to affect people. So now, the rule in the Catholic Church is that Catholics don't eat meat on Fridays only during Lent. But back then, it was every Friday. That was, that was the case. Which, which leads me to the second observation that I made in my, my growing up years that, that affected my understanding of fasting. And that is, I, would, I, I went to church occasionally when I was growing up, but I did not go to a church that observed Ash Wednesday or that, uh, that gave up anything for Lent. And so I'm living my life as an elementary school kid, and, and, I, and I started noticing that in somewhat random ways, all of a sudden a friend, would, a friend of mine would say, I can't eat chocolate. I can't eat candy. You know, and I, I was ignorant. You know, I'm just thinking, why not? That's dumb, <laughs> right? I mean, it just didn't make any sense to me. So, they would say, well, because I gave it up for Lent. And I didn't really know what Lent was. I knew what Easter was, but I didn't really understand the broader picture of Lent. And so, so that, was my, that was my earliest exposure to the idea of fasting. It, it seemed not really serious to me because it wasn't really about not eating. It was just about not eating certain things, things that I could live without. And so it didn't seem that, that important. And it also seemed a little bit trivial because the things that they would give up for Lent didn't seem to be all that important to me. It turns out what I've just described for you is probably not a very fair summary of the Roman Catholic understanding of fasting. But more pointedly, it's also not a very good summary of the Bible's teaching on fasting. I think it's pretty safe to say that, that fasting is often misunderstood. And we often tend to avoid things we don't understand. And therefore, I think for a lot of us, fasting is, is, is probably something that a lot of us don't have a whole lot of use for in our life because we don't, we don't get it. We don't, we don't really appreciate it. Part of the problem, I think, is, is realizing that we are primarily first world people, right? We, we don't have much of a concept of fasting except for the first world way of fasting, which is we don't eat chocolate for a while, you know, or we don't eat sugar for a while, or we don't, we don't drink certain kind of drinks for a while, like alcohol or, or some particular kind of alcohol that we don't particularly like anyway. You know, we, we, we create these, these ways of fasting that, that aren't really important to us anyway. 
or, or we might abstain from, from some kind of activity for a season where, you know, it's like we, we'll, we'll, we'll put our phones away, right? Try to live your, your life without your cell phone for a period of time or, or give up certain functions on your cell phone for a period of time or we won't play video games for a little while. Half of these things are things that people 30 and 40 years ago didn't even know what they were, right? How did we survive, right? I mean, so, so I think with, when we bring that kind of a mindset into fasting, it, it, even, it even makes fasting more confusing and less, less relevant for us. But in the early church, fasting was primarily related to food. And, and fasting wasn't just that you went without certain foods. It was you went without food. You didn't eat. And so when, when, you, when you have that, it's, it's not really, when, when you really press into it and, and start to think more deeply about it, what you start to realize is that it wasn't really for the sake of fasting. In other words, it wasn't really about what you weren't eating. Now, I know there are modern types of fasting now where we, where we, we really do focus on what you're not eating and what you are eating. It really is about your diet. You know, we talk about cleansing and resetting your gut, right? I mean, that, that's, that's sort of a, a more enlightened way of thinking about fasting with a purpose. But, but fasting in the Scriptures is, is really not so much about what you're eating or not eating. It's really about focusing on something else that is really important. Th- think about the way that fasting happens naturally or inadvertently in our lives without, without a plan, without intentionality. So, for example, many of you can get so wrapped up in your work on any given day that you will work right through lunch. Has that ever happened to you? It happens to me all the time. You ask the staff, what's the average time Dan eats lunch? <laughs> it's dinner time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Right? I mean, I, you know, I'm coming through, it's 3 o'clock, I think I'm going to go get some lunch. Because I'm just focused. And, I, and, I, and, and therefore, I'm focusing on something that for a, a moment has become more important to me than food. I don't feel the need for food because I'm not even thinking about it because I'm focusing on something else. In other words, my, my appetite for food has been replaced temporarily for, with, with my interest or my focus on something else. For many people, they, they, experiencing, they experience fasting when they lose a loved one, when you're grieving. They completely lose their appetite. They're just sick, right? They just feel terrible. And so they're not hungry. They aren't even interested in food. Because there's something that is consuming their heart. Sometimes we, we feel this when, when you have a breakup. You know, you go through a breakup. You've had this dating relationship and it ends. And well, you start to grieve. And you lose your appetite and you don't eat. And, and the people around you get concerned about you. You need to eat. Come on, take care of yourself. You don't want to take care of yourself because you're just focused on this thing, this loss that you feel. It can even happen when we're grieving something that we've done, you know, where we've hurt someone and we know it, or, or there's some sin that, that we have committed or that, we're, that, that we, we feel like we just can't get success with. And so we're, we're, we're consumed with sorrow and we're consumed with regret, and that's what we're focused on. This is fasting. This, this is all fasting that we don't plan on, right? It's, not, it's fasting that we don't even do on purpose. Well, I think what happened is that in the Scriptures, the, the Scriptures and, and in the ancient culture of God's people, this naturally occurring phenomenon basically became a pattern for focusing intentional spiritual discipline for the purpose of focusing our hearts and minds on the Lord. 
And it had become one of the top three spiritual disciplines for, for the people of Israel and God's people, even in the time of Jesus. It was giving offerings, praying, and fasting. That's what Jesus is talking about in this section of, of the, the Sermon on the Mount. Last week, we, we looked at the passage where he talks about giving and praying. And now we come to the part where he mentions fasting. And notice that Jesus, he doesn't give any indication here that, that any of these three things are wrong. They're not inappropriate. Even, even when he talks about how the hypocrites do these things, he doesn't, he's not saying that they shouldn't be done. He's just talking about the motivation of their heart while they're doing it. It's just like last week when we, when we talked about prayer. He said they pray to obtain the approval of people. He's saying the same thing here. They fast to impress people rather than to focus intently on the Lord. And Jesus says, don't be like them. He's not saying don't be like them and therefore don't fast. He's saying don't be like them in their heart motivation for why they do it. He says, when you fast, this is the the passage Carl just read for us, when you fast, don't look gloomy like the hypocrites. They disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen and, and recognized by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. They're trying to please people. people the people see them. That's their reward. Mission accomplished. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. In other words... There's a difference between being seen fasting and fasting to be seen. Does that make sense? It's all about the why. So so let's let's just get a a little bit of a working definition. This isn't some super duper spiritual definition for fasting, but but I think it's a helpful one. That fasting is foregoing for a purpose. It's, it's going without something for a purpose. Well, what's the purpose? Well, I'll give you five purposes. Five purposes. This is not an exhaustive list, but, but I think these are five pretty solid reasons that are described in the Scriptures for why fast. Why do this? So purpose number one would be to pray. Fasting and praying is, is very often bundled together in the Scriptures. They're, they're, they're paired up, praying, praying and fasting. If you're familiar with the story of Esther in the Old Testament, Esther was, was the, the queen, the, the, the wife of the king, but her people, the Israelites, were, were in, in, in danger. There had been a decree that the king had made in ignorance that was going to threaten the existence of, of the Israel peop- Israelite people. And so the problem she had was you weren't allowed to go into the presence of the king unless the king invited you. Well, she hadn't been invited into the presence of the king for a month. But she felt the need to go and to appeal for the safety of her people. And so she, she turns to Mordecai and, and she says... I want you to have the Israelites fast and presumably pray for me. As she went in to the king to seek deliverance for the people of Israel. Then in the book in, in Acts chapter 13, you have, you have the, the leaders of the church in Antioch, and, and it and it tell, the scripture tells us that. That the Holy Spirit had set apart Barnabas and Saul, who would, who would become Paul, to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. And so the church prayed and they fasted. And then they sent Paul and Barnabas off into their mission. If you think about it from a human perspective, you and I might not even be here knowing the Lord and worshiping the Lord here in church if it weren't for the fact that those church leaders in Antioch prayed and fasted. Because Paul and Barnabas were ministering to the Gentiles. 
Most of us are Gentiles. So you have fasting to pray. Purpose number two, we've already sort of uh, talked a little bit about this, but fasting to grieve. When David, King David in the Old Testament, learned in 2 Samuel chapter 1 that Saul, the king, and, and probably cl- more, more close to David's heart, Jonathan, the king's son, who was David's dear friend, David learned that they had died, both of them, Saul and Jonathan. And so in response, he and all who were with him mourned. And their mourning included both weeping and fasting. But fasting with grief, as as we've already said, can also be connected with grief over our sin. In the the book of Joel, the prophet Joel, chapter 2, Israel, God is calling Israel to grieve over their sins. He says, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So we've got fasting to pray, we've got fasting for the purpose of grief. Purpose number three is fasting to work, fasting to serve the Lord, fasting to minister in His name. You know, Jesus was in Samaria, and and most of you are probably familiar with this story where Jesus is talking with this woman at the well, and they're talking about worship, they're talking about living water, they're talking about wells that we often drink from that don't actually quench our thirst as a metaphor for for the things that we tend to look and pursue things in this world to to get satisfied and and fulfilled with, and they just don't, don't deliver. But not only does this woman come to to believe in Jesus. She comes to faith in Jesus, but then she goes and she tells everyone that she knows about him, and the people start coming out of the town to see Jesus for themselves. Well, all this time, Jesus is talking to this woman. He's by himself. His disciples are not with him. Well, then the disciples come back, and the disciples, they don't ask him a question about, who are these people? Who's that woman? Why are you talking to her? They don't ask her any, they don't ask him anything about that. You know what they ask him? The disciples come back from their errands and they say, "You need to eat." You ever know it's kind of funny actually. If you if you really pay attention to the experience of the disciples, to just notice how preoccupied they are with food. They really are. I mean, we we know this event as the the feeding of the 5,000. But really, Jesus was just teaching a bunch of people in a field, and everybody's enamored with his teaching, and Jesus is all into the sermon he's preaching, and the, and the, and the disciples come up to him and say, sorry to interrupt you, Rabbi, but we've got to get these people out of here. What? I'm preaching here. They're digging it. You know, they're, 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 they're enjoying what I'm saying. This is important. No, 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 we've got to send them home because we don't have any food, and they're going to get hungry. What? Well, then give them something to eat. Well, we don't have anything to eat, you know, and then, then it becomes a miracle, right? But it didn't start off about food. It's only food because the disciples are going, remember, we got to eat. You know, they're, like they're always looking for their next meal. In fact, when Jesus, when they come back to Jesus, you know the reason they, all, they missed this whole conversation with the woman at the well? You know where they were? Shopping. <laughs> Literally, they had gone off to buy food. So they come back. They don't say, What's, what's, what's this uh, revival that's broken out here in Samaria about, Lord? They say, no, you need to eat. And Jesus responds, this is in John chapter 4, he says, I have food that you do not know about. This is almost sounds like a line from the princess bride, you know, I know something you do not know. He says, I have food that you don't know about. And, and I, th- I think there is some degree of comedy here because in response, the disciples start asking each other, who brought him food? <laughs> right? Some, somebody, somebody showed up here and gave him something to eat and we don't know about it. What is, what, what's this food he's been eating that we don't know about? But he explains it. And he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. His work. 
You see, Jesus was not fasting in the religious sense. But the work that God had given him to do had become so vital to him, it had become so life-giving to him that, that food often just became incidental to him. It's an afterthought. Yeah, yeah, I'll eat. There will be a time for that. But so much of his life and ministry, the food, what gave him, what gave him life was doing the work that his father had given him to do. That's fasting, fasting to minister, fasting to work, fasting to serve the Lord. Purpose number four is fasting to give. Going without in order to be able to give to others. In Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 and 7, this is what the Lord says. He says, is not this the fast or the fasting that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? It's the idea of, of, of going without in order to be able to give to others. In 1 Kings chapter 17, there's a woman that Elijah the prophet goes to. God had, had actually instructed him to go to this woman. And, and there's a drought in the land. And this woman, we're, we're told, has a very small amount of water and a very small amount of flour. And that's all she and her, her household, particularly her and her son, have. But Elijah speaks to her the word of the Lord, and then she uses her little bit of water and her little bit of flour to feed Elijah. Do you recognize the risk that she took? She, she very easily could have been giving Elijah the last bit of food that she had and then had nothing left over for herself or for her son. But God provided in such a way that her flour and her water never ran out. She was willing, though, to go without in order to help this stranger that she had never met before. Lastly, purpose number five, fasting to grow, fasting to increase in strength in our life. We might assume that, that Jesus, the Son of God, had no need to, to be strengthened. He might, we might assume that he had no need to grow. He had no need to mature. But Jesus was, was not only fully God, he was also fully man. So there were times when the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. We see this in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus the Son of God, knew what He had to do. But Jesus, the Son of Man, was looking for another option. That's what the prayer of not my will but yours be done was about. This was about His flesh saying, is there a way that this could, is there any other way we can do this? But He had gotten to a place of strength where He could say, not my will but yours be done. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 5 says this, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Meaning, God didn't just cast him out when he said, Hey, is there a way we, we could get, get, do this a different way? God didn't just say, Depart from me, Satan. He was heard. He was he was patiently dealt with by the Father because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, don't, don't read this as Jesus was imperfect and he had to become perfect. Jesus was always perfect. But, but this idea of perfection doesn't just mean perfect the way we think of it. It also means completed. That, that, that everything gets, gets accomplished, everything gets finished. 
I think the writer of Hebrews is saying is that is saying that that it was through this suffering that he experienced that he that his preparation was made complete so that he became the source of eternal self, salvation to all who obey him to all who follow him here's here's what i wonder could it be that the 40 days of fasting and being tempted in the wilderness after his baptism was training for his flesh strengthening for his flesh in preparation for the mission that he had come into the world to accomplish and if so could it also be that that having seasons where we go without the comforts of this world maybe it's food maybe it's other other forms of comfort that we tend to to enjoy and take for granted. Maybe it's things that we, we tend to need and rely on, but really we don't need, that we could go without them, because these are things that tend to distract us. They're, they're things that we tend to depend on rather than depending on God. Could it be that, that seasons like that in our lives could be something that God could use to strengthen us, to grow us, so that we trust and depend on Him more. So that's kind of how, I, as, I've, as I've studied this, that's, that's really how I see fasting. That's, that's what it's about. There's fasting to pray. There's fasting to grieve. There's fasting to work and minister. There's fasting to give, and there's fasting to grow, to be strengthened. Let me, let me close by just by sharing two quick observations, and then it will be done. First of all, hunger in the Scriptures is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for our passions, for our long, you know, we, we hunger for things, right? We thirst for things. And, and it's not always food. It's, it's very often we're hungering and thirsting for things that we want, that we feel like we, we have to have in order to be satisfied or in order to be fulfilled. We know that, that if you take the analogy, food and drink don't fulfill us very long, right? If you're thirsty and you have something to drink, you say, oh, that hit the spot. Yeah, for about 40 minutes. And then you'll be thirsty again. Or we, we eat a meal and we say, well, that really, that really satisfies me. Well, until dinner time or until breakfast tomorrow or whatever it's going to be. We, we're always needing more. Ultimate satisfaction, ultimate being filled comes only from the Lord. That's why he says things like this. All you who are thirsty, come to me and I will give you water that will spring up life from your innermost being and you won't thirst that's the conversation he had with the woman at the well or jesus says this he says i am the bread of life the point being that when we follow jesus we have other food that the world does not know about the second closing observation here is that in Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, the disciples from John the Baptist, they come to Jesus and, and, and they ask, why, why is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? And listen to what Jesus says in response. He says, the wedding, the wedding guests don't mourn when the bridegroom is with them. The days will come when the bridegroom will be away from them, and then they will fast. In our passage today, in, in, in Matthew 6, particularly in verse 17, Jesus makes this statement that I think is, is it's not peculiar, but, but I think it, it, it might have deeper meaning than just what, what on, is on the face of it. He says, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. 
And I think on one level, Jesus really is simply saying, when you fast, don't look like you're fasting. Right? Don't, don't look like the hypocrites do because when they're fasting, they're a mess. Right? I mean, they, they, they wear it. Don't wear your fasting so that people know that you're fasting when that's happening. But I also think there's another level of, of implication for what Jesus is saying. In biblical times, anointing your head and washing your face wasn't necessarily a daily event. Not everybody had access to enough water to bathe every day. And, and they didn't have enough resources to be able to afford the oil that you would anoint your head with. Oil, you know, we think of oil as something that you just pour and it's kind of, you know, slippery and oozy and things like that. Oil in ancient times was, was really more associated with fragrance. It was something that made you smell good. And so, anointing your head with oil and washing your face wasn't, wasn't something that necessarily happened every day, but it was something that you would especially do in preparation for special occasions, like a festival, like where you would go to some celebration where there would be a feast. Isn't it odd that Jesus would, would say to us, when you fast, prepare for a feast? Prepare yourself like you're going to a celebration. You know, Jesus is away from us right now, right? He has is, he is ascended into heaven, and He is seated at the right hand of the Father where He lives to intercede for us, and that's good. And He has given His Spirit. He sent His Spirit, the Comforter, the Counselor, who lives inside of us. But before He left, remember what He said. He said that he will come back to us like a bridegroom for his bride. And it will be a feast. It will be the wedding feast of the Lamb. You know what breakfast is? It's literally break fast. It's the first meal that you eat when you come out of the fast. We call the first meal we eat in a day, in the, you know, at breakfast, because believe it or not, while you were sleeping, you were fasting, right? You weren't eating while you were resting. And so breakfast is, is a break of a really, really small fast. You know, when Jesus comes back as the bridegroom, and, and he takes us as his bride to be with him where he is, that celebration, that feast is going to be the most amazing breakfast you and I have ever had. Let me pray for us. Lord, we, we, we come to this topic not fully, at least for me, not, not fully understanding what it's all about, but thank you for, for showing us that, that fasting really is something that, that we do that, that helps us to focus on you. We take our focus off of the thing that we're not doing and we put our focus on you, whether it's to pray, to grieve, to serve and work and minister, to give and to grow. Lord, help us to consider that perhaps this discipline, this practice could become something more prominent in our lives, not to do it to be seen by people, but simply to take our eyes and fix them more intently on you that you might grow us and work in us and make us more and more the people you want us to be. And Lord, we thank you that, that fasting also reminds us that we have food that is not of this world, that we find it in you. And we look forward to the ultimate breaking of a fast when you come and you take us to be with yourself and we will, fe we will feast indeed in the house of Zion. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would please stand.